Good evening everybody, welcome to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, your number one podcast for all things Assassin's Creed. Today's episode we're going to be taking another look at Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And we're going to be asking the question, how Assassin's Creed Odyssey can fit mechanically in the Assassin's Creed universe. We're going to be offering our thoughts on the game as well, and what we like about it, and what we like about these events. Now, there is a bit of a um, black hole, as I would nickname it, in Odyssey's storytelling through multiple endings in the novel. So some things will come off as theory-based, so not everything in this episode will be set in stone. This is just a lot of thoughts and theories on how we see this game connecting with the universe. We're not just going to look at modern day, we are going to look at past game as well. So there's a lot to talk about. Um, before we jump right in, I'm not alone. I am joined by a good friend from the Sisterhood server, James. Hi everybody. I think everyone's getting used to meeting the queues now. This is the second person on time with the queues. This is getting good. Um, what can I say? I'm a professional. <laughs> well, we've got one professional among those people. <laughs> I mean, what? So, this is going to be an interesting game because Assassin's Creed Odyssey is a divisive game in the Assassin's Creed universe. Um, and I can understand where it's divisive with the combat and the gameplay, but. We're not going to look at that today because I have done other episodes on Odyssey in the past and I have looked at combat. I just really am still fascinated on how this game makes an impact on the um, Assassin's Creed universe. I know technically if you can keep the modern day very cohesive and very in line, any game can technically work in the past as long as it ties in with modern day. Could be wrong though. What do you think? The modern day in Odyssey is, if you ignore the DLCs, the modern day in Odyssey is quite short, isn't it? Um, you're only pulled out of the Animus twice before the ending. So it, it doesn't really, like I say, if we ignore DLCs, it doesn't really expand on the modern day. Um, although I must say the first time I, I uh, played the game and, and was drawn out of the Animus, um, I didn't know that the player was supposed to go and explore Layla's laptop and read all of these messages and, and emails and audio recordings. I, I had no idea what this modern day story was. Um, so I kind of ignored it and went straight back into my, my ancient Greece uh, recreation. So I'll be more interested in your view, Declan. What did you think of the uh, the modern day parts and, and did, how did they build on origins and, and fit into the wider story? To be honest, <laughs> not a lot, truthfully. Um, there is a good impact. There is the... After, I believe, there's no hint of it that I can remember or I am aware of. But after the events of Origins and finding the um, Hidden Truth message, which was the... Um, oh, I had it in my, t- my tongue. But it's the idea that reality is not real. Everyone this was in, one of the recordings that Bayek hears or maybe he doesn't hear but we as the player here is that right in the isu temples in the deserts of egypt yeah it's um the empirical truth right oh, to remember the, name. the whole idea that everything in assassin's creed valhalla in assassin's creed itself is fake desmond never lived desmond never died desmond never even killed lucy the whole idea that reality is different essentially so the modern day seems to play on the fine fact that in some unknown time frame before Origins and Odyssey, she works with Charlotte de Cruz from the Assassin's Creed comics. She integrates into the Brotherhood for William Miles. But upon finding Homer's Odyssey, she stumbles on more pieces of Eden that can, I believe, give her more information on this empirical truth nature that was addressed to her. And it kind of doesn't make sense as much, but when you play through Odyssey and you think about it from that point of view, does because Cassandra's whole timeline in the game is more of a redemption arc for her family. Mm, yeah. The cult and the hidden message at the end in the pyramid of order and chaos. It does kind of tie in a little bit and then when you meet Cassandra and you open up Atlantis in the end and you get all that it kind of ties in because even um Aflia talks about the end of the world is coming because Desmond should not of save the world so you see the connection the empirical truth talks about reality not being real mm. and time being 
essentially this is my own interpretation but time being its own entity and it can fix itself and then end of odyssey before the dlcs um aflia is talking about end of the world and time refixing itself so it seems a decent connection to me on that arc i like the idea that i, I think you, you mentioned it there that Alethius, she refers, I think, and again, this may be in the fate of Atlantis, but there are messages and, and conversations where they talk about running endless simulations, don't they, um, to work out how best to prepare for the modern day events after the uh, the Great Catastrophe, which potentially sets up that, that all of this is a simulation within a simulation in the style of Inception or something like that. But that would seem a little bit, um, that would feel like a little bit of a cheat for us as the player if actually we're not playing real historical events and real characters. We're sort of just running through another Isu simulation that that um, even the Animus doesn't exist. That's just part of the simulation. But we, we could go very deep into this uh, simulations within simulations. Um, but technically you do have a very valid point. And I know it's, and there's a joke that me and Josh did make about how the ending of Slash's Creed is you wake up, essentially. None of it happened, you just wake up. Yeah, in that could work. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if the fans and the players would really like that, but you could do that. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I would hate yeah, that. Yeah, so would I. So would I. I. I'm invested in these characters that I've spent hundreds of hours, you know, role-playing and, and reliving their memories of. Um, so if it was, uh, you know, surprise, it was all a dream, yeah, that would be a bit disappointing. But in essentially, Odyssey proves that can, canonically it can happen because as Aflia was able to make free, um, free simulations of True. Cassandra's afterlife yeah. inside the anime, so Cassandra could learn to wield the staff of Hermes, but at the same time, so can um, those, Layla understand it. Those simulations weren't inside... Uh, well, my, my understanding was... That Cassandra experienced those simulations in her life, we are able to experience them because she remembers them. So the animus is replaying those memories. But at the same time, the memories that are created for the animus are technically a simulation. They're not full yeah, memories. Fair point. So fair point. The animus would have had to technically recreate the simulation of as Cassandra's memory. So she would. So the animus technically create two simulations: the simulation of uh, her memory, but also the simulation of the Isu world, which is kind of trippy to believe. That it's <laughs> essentially, yes, she visited a simulation in the past, but Cassandra, I mean Layla, had to understand the simulation in the present to, so Ashley would understand if she was best to be the wielder of the staff. Indeed. So it is very much you are right in saying that. It's stupid for them to say it was just a dream. Mechanically, because of Odyssey, it could work like that. I don't want it to. Please don't, Daz. I'm just giving you an idea. <laughs> same, same. Please don't do that. But yes, you could you could, cause you could, could uh, frame the entire story in that way. Just on the topic of um, Alethea and the staff and training, uh, I don't think we'll do any spoilers here. Have you finished Valhalla's main story yet? Uh, I haven't. No, me, me so neither. Though. So we are both sort of in the dark about where it's going with uh, with Layla and the staff and everything else. But we do know, thanks to Odyssey, that Layla's actions at the end of Fate of Atlantis was not her fault. Indeed. And yes, I know everyone will probably at me about this and say what it was, but if you read the backstory to Layla in Origins, she's had serious anger management problems as a kid. Mm. She was yep. prone to blackouts and aggressive trips. She, It's not known if she has a high enough EC tra uh, trait in her DNA like Desmond to wield the Staff of Hermes. So wielding the Staff of Hermes would have really affected her mind, plus the bleeding effect because she never gave it enough time to settle in. She wasn't actually in control of her actions. She's possessed by the spear, which is why in Valhalla it's locked behind the case. Yes, yes. Do we know, again, this is reaching back, we, we were talking about Odyssey today, but potentially this question will cover all of the games. Do we know if Layla has spent more time in the Animus than any other subject? Or would you say her experience is similar to Desmond and others who've been in the Animus? Um, I would say similar to Desmond, because 
technically the initiate in Black Flag, I would probably say it was, I'm going to say in my mind a couple of days to a week maximum. Um, I don't know the exact time frame. The initiates for um, Syndicate and Unity, I'm also going to say probably a day to a week. But Desmond, I'll probably say was in there for a good six months, I believe oh, someone right, said. Right, a long time then, yeah. Uh, I think he got in there in what, September 2012 and died in sept- December 21st, 2012. So he was in there from September to December because they do try and follow human years. Mm, yes. Yeah. I'd say because uh, Layla has been in it for about a few years as well, but maybe, actually, maybe more because she did work with Charlotte Cruz in the background. So maybe probably more. Actually, I think she's actually been in it more. Mm. So, so <laughs> potentially am... she suffered as well because of that extended time. We are we are going very off topic for what you wanted to talk about today, but uh, it's, it's interesting to speculate. It's a good speculation because it does tie with Origins, because, I mean, Odyssey, because in Origins she was told she had to leave the Animus by the Doctor because mm. it was her kidneys because essentially she jacked Anonymous forced it to read DNA that isn't prone to her bodies as we used to, and it was rejecting her. So she used experimental tech to read by X DNA essentially. Yes. To me, that's going to give you serious more side effects than Desmond's bleeding effect because that's his ancestor, that's his memories. It's essentially like me forcing to live somebody else's memories from a million years ago. Mm. I might handle it. I can't process that body, the person's emotions, the feelings, the lifestyles, because that's not me. I'm not part of their DNA. So there probably was in Odyssey some knock-on effects to that, which is why she went mental at the end of the DLC. Yes, which... she, she, well, yeah, she, she, uh, she goes, she, she feels the effects at the end of the DLC, but there's also something in the area of memories quest, isn't there? Um, where she, so she starts to blend with Alexios, Demos, um, memories as well doesn't she when she's interrogating uh the the sculptor phidias um so we see that sort of extreme blending of her experience and uh demos which if her dna trait isn't of cassandra or demos then demos's anger his rage his emotions being bled into into layla would have made layla very unstable yes yeah so Back on the topic slightly. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time. It's so, fine. It's fine. So essentially, Odyssey can prove that a simulation of our inner simulation is real, but it can also prove that maybe what we're experiencing is just a fabrication or another reality. So it does pose the question that if if the EU can put a simulation inside a memory for us to read in another simulation, can they do it again? Without spoiling what I've experienced so far in Valhalla too much, I think the answer is yes. Absolutely. But, but that sort of trick wouldn't have been explored if Odyssey never kind of thought, well, what if we put a simulation of a, inside a simulation? You know? Mechanically, it asked the question, could the ESU tamper with someone's DNA simulation? And the answer is yes. Mm. And if they are able to tamper with someone's DNA simulation and still reach out to past and present, as we know this with Desmond, how much power does the ESU have even though they're not alive? They're not really here. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. And it's, it's what have they either embedded... What are they embedded in their devices, their um, pieces of Eden that they've left behind? What's embedded in human DNA as a as a leftover? Um, it's it's I mean it's as as a storytelling device, it's fantastic because it gives the the writers and the developers so much freedom potentially, doesn't it? Um, to introduce new new ways of telling stories, new new gameplay, and so on. Um, but yeah, it's. It's very interesting. In fact, thinking about the the point I made about Valhalla, we see that in Origins as well, don't we? As we mentioned earlier, with the temples where Bayek, and actually Aya as well comments on it, doesn't she? They do hear the voices that are stored or, or 
somehow connected to these temples that they explore. And if you go further back to the Ezio games, in um, one of the Ezio games, uh, Ezio himself shouts at Desmond. It's not possible. That's at the end of, is that the end of AC2 or the beginning of AC Brotherhood? Because, and again, your, your listeners may be a little shocked. I've only played AC2 and then the newer games. And I think that might be at the end of AC2, isn't it? Where, um, who is the Isu? Is it Minerva at the end of AC2? She does talk directly to Desmond through Ezio. And he, he sort of says, what is this voice? What is going on here? Um, so he can hear it and Desmond can hear it. Essentially, yes. And it it's something that's been... This is when I'm about to get lynched by all my listeners. <laughs> being box, but Assassin's Creed has spent too long asking the questions of Assassin's vs. Templars for far too long. Odyssey, kind of clear by law, is now asking the questions of how much influence does the Isu have. Now, technically, the Isu have had a lot of influence in Desmond through um, Assassin's Creed 1 to Assassin's Creed 3. They even had influence on the corner. Um, they didn't have much of an influence in Black Flag. Um, they were there, but there was uh, more of the Sage, which I'm not really going to count with an Isu, because the Sage is just a reincarnation of um, Juno's husband. So it's more of a human that is in the life. It's confusing. Sage has confused me. But essentially, and then when Juno has escaped and uses human technology to become free, and then comics actually give her a body, Another episode, people, I am planning to discuss Juno's whole birth, life to death thing, how she came back alive. But as you can see, what I'm trying to say is that there's been snippets of the Isu, and I know I'm rambling a little, but Odyssey canonically just shoves that in your face and gives you more questions for the Isu, yeah. which yeah. I think is needed for storytelling and just... I just want to know more about the Isu. I know there's a big super people who are pieces of Eden, but how much influence do they have on our time, even though they're not here? Yeah, it's it's an interesting point. And is that influence just through the devices they've left behind, like the start of the staff of Hermes Trismegistus? Is it through the DNA memories that are embedded? Is it through certain locations that have, what can we say, Isu influence left over? Um, or are there, is it something a little more active and real? And that this is where I think Odyssey, and it's more of a, it, as I said at the start, it's more of my own theory and interpretation, but it's why when I play through Odyssey and the Fate of Atlantis, it does seem to ask that question a lot more with, can the Isu intercept the Animus simulations? Do they know that Layla is running these simulations? And can they intercept them and change them if they so wanted? Or I think that's possible. discussed. Ooh. I think that point is... I think Aletheia discusses exactly that point in Odyssey. Now, whether it's in the main game when you do the Air of Memories, or whether it's in the DLC in the Fate of Atlantis, I can't remember. But I think she she, she has a, sen a few sentences where she says that they've run... The Isu ran endless simulations about how life would progress and humanity would progress after their doom and they predict through those simulations that the animus will be created and it will be a way of exploring information that otherwise would be lost to time so i think that's covered in in some of the, the conversations that aletheia has with cassandra so i think i think they predict it that's the way of that's the way of summarizing they predict the animus will exist at some point in the future and if they predict through the animus, then they would have predicted ways to use their conscience to interact with the animus. Absolutely. To leave either hidden or, or not so hidden messages and locations for the animus to explore. Yeah, absolutely. Plus, in Odyssey, and I'm paraphrasing, Alethea does mention about coming back. It's There's a huge quote about it that I did have up, and suddenly my notes have disappeared, so I do apologise. <laughs> She does make a quote about um, it's time they stop taking um, stops taking a step back and start intervening. So that quote of start interfering kind of kind of has me thinking: Can they come into our world through the animus? Mm, yeah. What are we? I mean, I I'm about 
80% through Valhalla and it will be interesting to see where it's going because there are I won't spoil any of the key points but there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting material isn't there uh, embedded into the story of Valhalla and exposed through the animus and I'll, I'll say no more than that but it's very interesting to see where it will go um, is I, I always had the thought to myself at the end of Fate of Atlantis can you as the player or can Cassandra can Layla trust Alethea I don't think so she certainly presents herself as the um the benign side of the Isu but I I never fully kind of committed to that myself when I was uh, playing through those stories so it'd be interesting to see where her character goes and what what happens at the end of the modern day in Valhalla but I I do agree I don't trust Alethea but it, it does seem to me that Odyssey is trying to show us that there is a lot more in the first civilization and how they can affect the animus and the people around them. And I think for the lore of the Sakuna universe, this is a massive thing because we've seen drips and drabs the influence of the Isu and this and that. But in Odyssey, we're seeing that these so called beasts of myth, like Medusa <laughs> and yes. Ita, were created by apples of Eden embedded in mutated human DNA by Juno and her husband. <laughs> as you know in the um as it explained in the Fate of yep. Atlantis. Yep. So that's kind of trippy to believe that these creatures may have existed not as huge tales of magic and might, but through Isu science. That's kind of scary to think. That was something that really worked for me because I was I was aware of the real world history of greece and the, and the various states and, and wars and so on i was aware of the the greek mythology so for me as a new player to have this kind of backstory that weaves together the war was created by this this cult that wanted to solve the the strife between the states and these these creatures of myth were real but they weren't the creatures you think they were they were human experiments from tens of thousands of years previously. That worked for me as a as an overall kind of um, structure to why um, these things existed and why the Greeks believed in these um, these myths because they weren't myths; they were real. And I thought that was fan. I mean, it's fantastic from a gameplay to go and do some boss fights, but it was fantastic from a story point of view as well. And from a story point of view, exactly as you said, I think also. Um, helps kind of clean the law that these stories about beasts and creatures of myth and magic may not have actually existed through normal means but somebody could have walked into an Isu temple and seen a hollow projection of a werewolf or uh, the minotaur or even a gorgon or anything and interpret it as reality because humans do tell stories but it could have just been a defense mechanism to guard the Isu vaults absolutely absolutely and this may sound like I'm talking crazy, but Odyssey seems to be doing a lot of mini law fillers to, well, I wouldn't class them as law because I'm not so sure any of this is a possibility. <laughs> uh, I know I know they did do the Manitor and um, Medusa through human experiments, but to me, it seems this is a lot more filler for the first civilization, and it's something that we need in the Assassin's Creed history. If you play more from one to origins you'll see that the first civilization is more of a footnote to the history of assassins versus templars when in my opinion this should be as front and center as assassins versus templars that was you know that was a question i was going to ask you on this on this podcast which is so let me think i've played i have started ac1 but it kept kept crashing and i kind of gave up after about an hour having reinstalled the game multiple times played ac2 started ac brotherhood but but not progressed very far what what came out was it did i start it just when valhalla came out and I, I wanted to play the new game anyway so i've played the newer games but but not the earlier games so my, my question for you was does odyssey give us the most detailed look at the isu the people potentially their their cities and where they lived although we know that was a simulation not real does it does obviously give us a much better look at them than all the previous games? Essentially, yes. When you play all the other games, you do see 
the influence of the Isu in the world through the temples, through the artifacts. But the most you see of Isu from 1 to um, 3 is Juno and Minerva, so 2 Isu, but you see them quite vividly. In Black Flag, you see a sage, which is um, Juno's husband, reincarnated. So that's technically an Isu in human form, in my opinion. Um, I don't recall any Isu in Unity, but I do remember Juno making an appearance in Syndicate. And that's really it. Mm. Origins have the temples and the artifacts, but in here, in honestly, we're getting a full city. We're getting Hades, Prometheus, and I know everybody argues that you shouldn't make um, pre-established gods easy. <laughs> I've I've read that argument quite a lot recently, especially with with what we're experiencing um, in the new game as well. And I I don't follow that argument myself. I think it makes perfect sense. Not that the Isu were literal gods who created the earth and the universe, but they are how the protagonist in their time understood the Isu. So Cassandra, in, in the simulations that Aletheia creates, Aletheia presents Persephone, Hades um, and Poseidon because they are characters that Cassandra could have some appreciation of, some understanding of, and understand the context. So they, I, I never interpreted those simulations, those three chapters of the DLC, as this is really what the Isu look like, and this is really what the Isu uh, lands and cities look like, but it's an approximation. So it kind of it bridges the gap between the real Isu of 75,000 years ago and Cassandra's time and what she was brought up through her childhood to understand through Greek myth and Greek gods and so on. And so for me, it works. And it, and it, it works um, as well with what we're seeing in the new game. Um, I, I don't get the, uh, the, uh, the, the pushback on that point, to be honest. I also think, um, and I mean, this is where Odyssey makes another great connection, is everybody knows that Gr Greeks were great storytellers, <laughs> philosophers, yes. mathematicians, and everyone knows this. And the old history of the Peloponnesian War in Homer's Odyssey, I believe, talked about giant ants. <laughs> uh, will... he, um, um, is that in the Odyssey, or is that in Herodotus? I think it's Herodotus. Okay. It's in one of one of them. I'm, I read an article on it. Maybe we'll laugh. But <laughs> there is some. I, I have read Herodotus's um, history. Um, I read it last year, but off the back of the game. So hey, the game's educational because it inspired me to read. Um, and yeah, there are some stuff in there where you think, yeah, this is completely, this 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 is not real. But you know, he there, there was no internet. He couldn't fly a plane to go and check whether these lands really existed. He was writing down what he was told from people who travelled thousands of miles on foot or on horse or on camel or whatever. So there's inevitably going to be. Um, inaccuracies but that doesn't reduce the the interest in the fact that some of this information is in herodotus book anyway um is accurate um, i think the odd was the odyssey is a little more fantasy isn't it so we can accept that there might be giant ants or, or whatever um in the story but i think canically it can actually prove that an isu could walk up to a human and say hey my name's zeus and he could have a ring or anything that produces electricity because of how scientifically advanced they were, it would just look like magic. And that human's going, hey, God, Zeus just made lightning in his yep. hands. It's absolutely. Not absolutely. lightning, it's science. And then stories progress to me, have you heard about our God, Zeus? And you cannot tell me a being so powerful and so scientific as the Isu that had literally just been wiped out, spent 10 years of war with the humans, and not going to want the humans to worship their feet again. <laughs> you can't tell me that even though they are science and they're using logic, that, sorry, sorry for the term, but pre feeble mind, you're going to think, hey, that's godly. Absolutely. And, it on it. and I think Odyssey kind of shows that the belief systems are going to be played on a bit by the Isu. Um, so I think the last point I want to make is one I've been in discussion with for ages and I've brought my trusty encyclopedia, which essential guide, recommend it. And my trusty novel for this. Yes. But 
did Cassandra mechanically help create a pseudo Templar order? Now, you're probably going to say no. A lot of people listening to it will know. I, I killed a spear, or I almost a spear, but mechanically, the spear lived for quite a few years afterwards. But at the end of the game, she talked about a Prince of Logic. Uh, was it Prince of Logic? Uh, a philosopher king. king philosopher king that was the phrase wasn't it yeah, yeah a philosopher king um and she wanted like a new order built on logic and one rule a philosopher king that ubisoft has quoted as father of understanding mm. and technically as we know from xerxes being killed by darius xerxes was uh, stated to power by the cooperation of the cosmos and order of ancients so is it too much of a stretch to believe that when we wiped out the cult of Cosmos by a spear, she created a new branch for the Order of Ancients, a stronger branch? There is definitely enough gap in the real or the known history of Aspasia, the historical character, for that to have happened. Um she 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 either dies or she fades from the historical record at about 400 BCE, which is 18 years after the canonical events of Odyssey finish, which is 422. A lot can happen in 18 years. Um, one of the things I think is interesting is canonically Cassandra leaves Aspasia, or allows Aspasia to leave the uh, the Temple of Cosmos. Um, although in, in game we, we are given the choice to to kill her, to let her walk, or to romance her. Um, but canonically, she allows Aspasia to walk. So the question is, Aspasia was well known, she was wealthy, she was connected, she had she certainly had the, the opportunity um, to make contact with the Order of Ancients in Egypt and elsewhere. Um, she would have had the resources to do it. Um, but also she would have learned a lot, probably, from her time with the cult of Cosmos and dealing with people like Cassandra. Um, maybe maybe build or improve the Order of Ancients based on everything that went wrong in uh, in Greece when uh, the cult of Cosmos um, happened to uh, annoy Cassandra and uh, drive Cassandra onto her personal odyssey. So there's, there's certainly, there's, there's everything aligns that, that anything's possible. And I think there is enough evidence to prove that, mechanically, maybe she did. Because when you look at um, Xerxes, Xerxes um, was the tried to form in power during the second Persian invasion of Helos. And uh, that's when they first worked together. And in the canonical Odyssey novel, Aspir is saying the dream of Hel Helios as a republic, no more squabbling city states. Mm. And it computing ideologies of democracy and I can't read properly but anarchy or oligarchy Oligo oligarchy no uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just like <laughs> saying I can't read <laughs> no more blue and red no more factitious leagues one realm controlled utterly by a true leader a philosopher king to guide us all is kind of essentially they try to sack um, Helas once in the second Persian invasion yes. to the states um to get Xerxes stated as the king of Greece, it's not really too stretch to say that she wants that dream of Helas to be ruled under one order, one king, a father of understanding, essentially, as Ubisoft have quoted in the Central Guide. And with her gone to the shadows and uh, Cassandra not being able to follow her, it kind of leaves that, as you said, 18 years. What did she do in 18 years? Mm -hmm. Mm. Can it, I don't think we can say no, she never created a or joined the Order of Ancients because there's too much evidence to prove that maybe she tried. Is there any see origins we 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 we're, we're battling the Order of Ancients, but that's three hundred and fifty years later. But does Origins leave us any clues about what the Order was doing between no, it doesn't, because Odyssey came after in terms of release date. I was trying to think, are there any sources that cover that 350 years of blank history, canonical sources? I'm not sure there are. Um, no, because unfortunately, with 
how the game works, Odyssey is pretty much just a big prequel mm. to um, uh, Origins, but it's just essentially kind of does saying that if you didn't include the uh, DL, the first DLC of the Hidden Blaze DLC, which is good for the connection of Aya being a descendant of Cassandra, which I thought was kind of cool. Absolutely. Seeing Darius um, Hidden Blaze for the first time was also cool, but in theory, if you took out that DLC and you left it as it as it is, then there's nothing to say that when a spear talks about a philosopher king or, as in the um, essential guide states, a father understanding, that that order of ancients in origins could have been from what a spear wanted. Does that make sense? And it seems we may have lost. James I'm back. Well. I'm sorry. <laughs> we may have to edit out that. I was taught my my screen <laughs> my screensaver clicked on, so I spent ten seconds hurriedly just unlocking my screen, realizing I couldn't unmute myself. But we can we can edit that out. I'm sorry about that. Uh, or we just leave it in. Um, so my question was, um, I've lost my train of thought now. Oh, yeah, that was it. So. <laughs> The Father of Understanding, that we know it's referred to in, in lots of different resources. The Templars talk about it. Um, do you think that's an Isu person, a human person, or just more of an idea that they aspire to? I, I think it's... Um, I interpret it. I know there is more law guys to what the Father of Understanding is, but I haven't got that note on mm. me, so I apologise. But my interpretation is, is it's an idea, a person. They're trying to become above God. Um, to reference Valhalla quickly, uh, and a bit of a spoiler for the Jorvik arc, have you beat the Jorvik arc? Um, I have completed, yes, I have completed Jorvik, yes. So it, it is referenced that in the Jorvik arc, the Firebrand wants to delete all Christian texts. Yes. So there is a possibility that the triumph the father understanding is above God. It's one ideology. We don't want a world divided by religion, by democracy. We want the world aligned in one order under one person, the father of understanding. Mm. And there is more law notes on it, so I'm going to apologize to all the listeners. I don't have them notes on this computer. I need to transfer them over tonight. So I do apologize. I don't have more information on me at the moment. But let's but let's continue that thought. So um, we we know that the Templars they kind of when, when they're praying might be the wrong word, but they they ask for the Father of Understanding to guide them. Um, did they pick up that belief in the Father of Understanding? And the Father of Understanding, as you said, is referenced in Valhalla, and the events of which occur a thousand years, twelve hundred years after Odyssey. Do you think it's Aspasia that takes that idea of a philosopher king, a father of understanding, and introduces it to the Order of Ancients? Or did the Order of Ancients already have that belief in the father of understanding before Aspasia and the events of Odyssey? I personally believe, from what I've read, that um, Aspasia's knowledge of the father of understanding isn't her own. She saw it in the pyramid. At, at the same time that Cassandra saw Pythagoras warn about all ah, the chaos. Interesting. So I believe that she was more of a pawn. She uses that information, the idea of, um, to spread the message through the Order of Ancients, because if you look at the Order of Ancients and Origins, there already is a hierarchy system with Julius Caesar as the father of understanding. Right. Okay, so it's, so, it's a title that he assumes, although... It, it's not necessarily a, a mystical, maybe it is mystical, maybe it becomes mystical over time because understanding of faith and and so on changes over time, doesn't it? Um, there's, there's the, I think the, the point there is there's a lot we could, there's a lot of unknowns that we could dive into um, and we can speculate to fill in the gaps between Aspasia and the events at the end of Odyssey and then Origins and then Valhalla and so on. And I, I'm not 100% sure now if I'm going to admit that. I don't know if actually Julius Caesar was the father of understanding, but I believe 
who was known to be the father of understanding at some point. Um, but yeah, it is essential to believe that technically Cassandra could have wiped out the Call of Cosmos and then using the connection that the Call of Cosmos had with the Order of Ancients, Espia would have been a wealthy person to align with them, which would have mean that Cassandra unknowingly helped shape a stronger cult to take over Greece by accident, in theory. Absolutely. Yeah, that that that, that possibility exists with, with Aspasia walking away, being allowed to live, taking what she's learned, taking her wealth, her resources. Yeah, it's it's possible that Cassandra's actions <laughs> which which is kind of ironic. But yeah, it's possible her actions drove that change. Um, but, uh, yes, um, uh, just quickly for my notes, yes, Septimus did reply that Caesar was the father of understanding. Right, okay. Uh, so I was right. So, but, I mean, it essentially proves one of the greatest messages in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, the order through chaos, that the chaos was the cult of cosmos, which Cassandra stopped, and that led could have led a spear to go form an order, which would have been the order are born out of chaos. So Cassandra essentially helped shape balance. There was too much chaos, so it needed order, and she created the order needed for balance. In theory, of course. Absolutely. I like that, though. It works. It works. So, Sally, I think that's all we've got time for tonight. My back's getting stiff. I'm getting old, people. <laughs> It's not the age, it's the mileage. That's what it'll do. That's what will do it. Yeah, it's the mileage and the... <laughs> I don't do my miles. I'm not an old car just yet. So, I want to thank James for popping along for this talk. Thanks for having me. It's been great. I've really enjoyed it. And if you guys want to be on the show or have any um, knowledge or any questions about Odyssey that I may have missed or help me understand because... I am transferring from one laptop to another, so I do apologise that a lot of my notes have been lost in transit. I'm not very skilled with a USB drive half the time. <laughs> Plus I lose that as well. But if you want to be on the show, or you want to have your say, or interact in any way, please email me at assassinscreedletstalk at gmail.com, or find me on Twitter, where you can actually DM me anytime you want kind of a dangerous question to ask when sometimes I'm offering theories on how Odyssey is amazing. <laughs> you know, I am I loved Odyssey. I thought it was fantastic. So I'm always happy to support that point and uh, have those debates as well on Twitter. I, I will always say Odyssey is a fantastic game, but in my opinion, Odyssey is only fantastic if you read the canon novel. Uh, yes, I, that's it's a good point. It sounds counterproductive, but the story in the canon novel, if you tied, if you mirrored the actions like I did when I played it on the second playthrough, you realise it was a goddamn good story in there. Mm. Mm. It is amazing. I've only read the novel once, I'll be honest, I kind of, I burned through it in, in a day. Um, and I would like to read it again, because I listened to your episode from a, a couple of months ago where you talked through Odyssey's canon story based on the novel. Um... And the one bit that always stuck in my mind from the novel, which I missed from the game, and it, I wish it had been in there, is there's additional interactions between Cassandra and Phoebe that really build that relationship. And we get a little bit of it in the game, but we definitely missed just a... a I think in the in the book it's a hide-and-seek, isn't it? A little game of hide-and-seek um, when Cassandra gets to Athens. That would have been great in the game. That would have added a bit of depth to the characters and to their relationship, and I think we really missed that. I agree, but I think it would have also kicked everyone in the teeth when they just punched <laughs> Yes, even more so, yeah. You know, I wanted to cry after what happened at Phoebe because I would have got a connection, but yeah. I was reading the novel at the same time, so I was like, oh, I remember all these little details. Yeah. I'll tell you, can I tell you one little funny story from, from about the book um, before you uh, sign off the podcast? So the, the book I've got in my hands here is, is the paperback, nothing fancy, but um, we met myself and my daughter, who's played Odyssey as well, uh, Melisanthe and Michael, uh, in 2019, and they both signed the book. So um, 
and on the front page it says uh, to my daughter from Cassandra and she signed it then on the next page it says to my daughter Alexios is the best signed by Michael Antonakos so Michael always representing Alexios always makes me laugh I really want to chat to them too them I have seen so much of the dev talks of them two doing questions and them two are hilarious together, they are, honestly. They're like a, a naughty brother and sister. They really are. They're fantastic. I would love to have a chance just to chat to them on the podcast one day to talk about Odyssey. And I'm going to make the dream come true one day, people. I will find my contacts. I will find my sources. And one day, we will get a voice actor from Assassin's Creed on this show. That would be awesome. One day. Awesome. I'll, I'll have to make cookies for them. Everyone needs cookies. <laughs> Absolutely. So, join my show for chocolate chip cookies. There you go. Can't go wrong. <laughs> so, um, thank you all for listening, and I'll catch you all next week.